Thank you, President Lee. It certainly brings back so many wonderful experiences to be here with you this morning. These devotional assemblies have always been a place of pleasant times, and I remember times when I was awake, too. It's wonderful to contemplate the opportunities that you have, and I can remember how excited I was here as a student, how many things I thought there were to do, and many people to meet. And I was blessed to be able to meet my companion Margaret here. I remember meeting her the first fall, seeing her across a crowded room, as it were, at a dance, and she was very popular, and I was from Idaho. <laughs> um, Several years later, we did strike up a more familiar friendship, and in fact, I remember we started a singing group uh, called the Why Americans uh, and asked Margaret to be part of it, and then one day we got a telegram. I got a telegram from Ed Sullivan inviting us to be on his television show. I have that telegram in my Treasures of Truth. And we flew back on an airplane, and I held hands with Margaret all the way there and all the way back, and been trying to do that ever since. We do have an interesting perspective on the BYU experience that stems from three different periods of association. As I mentioned, we were first here as students. That began in the fall of 1964, nearly 30 years ago. We returned 12 years later in 1976 and spent some wonderful years as a faculty member, during which time I, I also served as a bishop on campus, as President Lee has mentioned. And we now experience BYU from the perspective of our children, as he has also suggested. Some months ago, I overheard President Lee talking to a parent who had several children here. He teasingly said, President, you have more of our children, not to mention our money, than we do. He replied with a classic line that I wish I had used as a university president and which endeared him to me in a way that only parents can appreciate. He said, I only hope we can do as well with them here as you have done with them in your home. President Lee, you and the faculty and staff are a great blessing in the lives of men and women who are students here, and you are definitely doing well with them. We thank you. Representing all of your parents, I hope you know how much we love you and how much of our joy and satisfaction is bound inextricably to your success and happiness in life. The Apostle John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. In that vein, I've gained a deeper appreciation for an experience I had here 28 years ago. I was a 24-year-old return missionary, senior chemistry student, sitting in my off-campus apartment when a knock came at the door. I opened the door, and there stood my mother. She came in, and we had a wonderful visit. It was a visit of love, of humor, grace, and some subtlety. I realized when she left that she had determined, among other things, what I was eating, who I was dating, how my grades were, how I was doing in church, and perhaps had a better idea than I did about what I was going to do the rest of my life. She also had inspected the kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom. She drove 200 miles, spent an hour with me, and drove 200 miles back home. Such is a mother's love and a father's love. I have come to appreciate that there were some very important things my mother was concerned about, beyond how much top ramen I was eating. I distinctly remember during those years the conversations with roommates until 2 or 3 in the morning. Years later, as a bishop, I counseled my ward members about similar concerns. And now, more years later, these are the concerns of my children. Fundamentally, they have not changed. What should I major in? How should I earn a living? Who am I going to marry? Where am I going to live? Will I have a family? It's evident that these questions and the potential consequences of their answers create feelings of uncertainty of anxiety and generate, as the French say, a certain malaise. Those decisions that you are wrestling with are appropriate to your stage in life. And you may suppose that once you've successfully made them, it will be smooth sailing. Would that it were so. 
Unfortunately, they will be replaced by the anxiety and uncertainty of death, disease, false accusations, loss of job, and loss of loved ones. So how is one to cope at your age with your particular set of challenges or at any later age with the inevitable circumstances that can cause the apprehension, anxiety, and angst that so heavily weigh us down? I do not fully know the answers to that question, but I would like to speak to three notions that I believe can make a difference. Let us visit together about increasing faith, reaffirming trust, and rekindling love. Much has been said about faith because it's the most fundamental of doctrines in the plan of redemption. We speak of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the first principle of the gospel. In the first verse of the eleventh chapter of Hebrews, Paul taught, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. One challenge to the ready understanding of this definition is the implication that faith is substance or evidence. And this runs counter to the general use of the word, which usually is interpreted to mean that something accepted on faith is accepted without proof, evidence, or substance. The footnote, footnote to this verse fortunately explains that the pro prophet Joseph Smith preferred to translate the word substance as assurance. So using the word assurance and adding several additional words, let us formulate an expanded expression that provides significant insight into the issue of faith. The expanded expression is, having faith is having or accepting an assurance of things hoped for and accepting evidence of things not seen. Let's continue by dealing with the first part of the expanded definition. Having faith is having or accepting an assurance of things hoped for. The meaning is enhanced considerably by understanding what is hoped for. Throughout the scriptures, the objects of hope are stated as hope in eternal life, hope in a glorious resurrection, and hope in Christ. Moroni provides a superb one-verse summary in chapter 7, verse 41. He says, And what is it that ye shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you that ye shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto life eternal, and this because of your faith in him, according to the promise. So our passage reads, Now having faith is having or accepting an assurance of Christ, his resurrection, his atonement, and eternal life. This expanded expression fits beautifully with the twelfth and thirteenth chapters of Alma. Alma speaks of men being ordained priests for the purpose of teaching the plan of redemption. He then explains that they were called and prepared according to the foreknowledge that God had concerning their faith and good works. Now one might wonder how it was possible to have faith, or good works for that matter, in the pre-mortal world where there was presumably no veil and no earthly distractions. But in fact, we could elect to have faith in the plan. Faith then was the same as faith now. Faith was having or accepting an assurance in the plan of redemption. It was not a slam dunk. We had to accept assurance that Christ would do what He said He would do, that He would follow the plan, that He would come to earth as an infant, be tempted, suffer pain. Could He really do it? Some of us accepted the assurance offered. Some did not. Continuing on with the definition, what is the nature of the assurances? Well, suppose we partition them into two kinds, divine assurances and personal assurances. What a blessing to know that it's indeed possible to receive divine assurance of things hoped for. The 46th section of the Doctrine and Covenants contains a marvelous discussion of gifts given by the Spirit of God. Verses 13 and 14 state, To some it is given by the Holy Ghost to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He was crucified for the sins of the world. To others it is given to believe on their words that they might have eternal life if they continue faithful. This scripture speaks of both kinds of assurances, heavenly, those that come through the Holy Ghost, and personal, those that come to us by way of another person. The scripture teaches us that to some is given to believe on the words of others, that is, to accept their personal assurances of things hoped for. 
Now, this important point deserves some additional comment. We attend each month a special meeting called the Fast and Testimony Meeting. These are unusual meetings, both in terms of format and content. Their purpose is to build faith. When we bear our testimony, we have an opportunity to provide assurances that others might accept. But if we wish to increase faith and to be in harmony with the purpose of the meeting, those assurances must be of the things hoped for. You see, warm personalities, charisma, and travel experiences all have some appointed place. But the basic issue for a testimony meeting is whether or not we can stand and add our witness, add our assurance that there is a plan of redemption, a Savior, an atonement, a resurrection, and eternal life. Now let me illustrate. I know a young, impetuous, but very loving bishop who, after a testimony meeting, approached a youthful member of his ward who had spoken in that meeting and said in a way that only he could, that's an interesting testimony that you bore. Would you be willing to take this Book of Mormon home, read it every day, and come back next month and try it again? Now I hasten to add that this is not standard operating procedure. We would never want to risk offending anyone in an area as sensitive as that of personal testimony. And in this case, the person was unoffended, but motivated, and returned the next month to strengthen others with a strong witness of things hoped for. Our definition now reads, Having faith is having or accepting divine and personal assurances of Christ, the atonement, the resurrection, and eternal life. Let us add the second part of the definition. Now, faith is the evidence of things not seen. We will work with the restated expression as cited earlier, having faith is accepting evidence of things not seen. That this is exactly the meaning that Paul had intended is confirmed by examining verse 3 of the same chapter 11 of Hebrews. It says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. While his wording to us may seem awkward, he's simply affirming that the worlds we see are evidence of the Word of God which we do not see. Thus the restatement, having faith is accepting evidence of things not seen, is consistent with Paul's example, in which the existence of the world should be accepted as evidence of the unseen Word of God which created it. In the same manner that assurance was divided into divine and personal, let us now partition evidence into two parts. Call the partitions macro and micro. So what is the macro evidence we can accept? I agree with Paul that the earth and the seas and the mountains and the streams and the glorious world we live in is rich visual evidence of God's unseen hand. The scriptures are replete with prophetic utterance on this issue. And I would say parenthetically that while here as a student, I majored in chemistry and minored in math and physics. I read and studied about the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, quantum mechanics, and relativity. And I've read and studied geology and the fossil record and evolution. I subscribe to Scientific American and read almost every article. It's all more or less useful. But all the evidence I ever needed came one night as I camped on the banks of the Snake River and lay on my sleeping bag, looking up through the pine trees at the same glorious heavens that Abraham saw. My favorite expression of this macro evidence is in the words of the hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. 
here in the glorious tops of the everlasting hills, can there be any question about the handiwork of God? I believe the scriptures also serve as <clears throat> extraordinary macro evidence of things unseen. The Book of Mormon especially is hold in your hand, read and study big evidence, just the kind that Paul had in mind. What about micro evidence? Micro evidence is a convenient taxonomy for including all the personal and individual experiences that each of us has that serve as evidence of the hand of God. They're private experiences. They're often sacred experiences. Some ought not to be shared. Some can be. I well remember such a personal experience that took place just a few, few blocks from here. It was more than 12 years ago. Margaret had gone into labor a month early, and about 3 a.m. on a beautiful June morning gave birth to identical twin boys. After learning that she and the twins both seemed well, I was much relieved and went home for a few hours of sleep. About 7 a.m. the phone rang. It was a call from the hospital explaining that the second twin born was in serious trouble and I should come quickly. I called my counselor in the bishopric, who was also an administrator at the hospital, and asked if he could meet me there immediately. And then I knelt in prayer and rushed to the hospital, hoping to arrive in time to give the baby a priesthood blessing and, if necessary, a name. We found the baby lying in an isolate, a specialized chamber for premature infants. He was blue and gasping for breath. To my dismay, he was so small and hooked up to so many tubes and pieces of apparatus that we couldn't find any way to place our hands on his head to administer a blessing. After some agonizing moments, we determined that there was a spot on his little chest about the size of a half a dollar that perhaps we could touch. And so reaching under and through and around all the tubes and the equipment, we were able to get the very tips of four enormous index fingers on that one tiny available spot on his chest. And we blessed him that he would receive special medical attention, that his life would be spared, and that he and his brother would serve together as missionaries in the year 2000. And that day in our family, we received some very personalized micro evidence of the unseen power of God. We have expanded Paul's definition of faith and can now summarize. Having faith is having or accepting divine assurance and personal assurance of things hoped for, namely a living Savior, a resurrection, an atonement, and eternal life. It is accepting macro evidence and micro evidence of the unseen but very real power of God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now I suggest that you take an inventory. Where do you stand relative to receiving a heavenly assurance that there is a plan of redemption, including all the things hoped for? Count up the personal assurances from those who have borne witness and testimony to you, and include among them the powerful assurances coming to you from my brethren of the general authorities. Rehearse to your satisfaction the macro evidence that is shouted from God's handiwork and spoken plainly from the scriptures. Enumerate your own experiences, the undeniable expressions of the power of God, unseen but clearly demonstrated. Each of us in our personal life can take such an inventory. And for most of us, the assurances, both heavenly and personal, and the macro and micro evidence when reviewed is so overwhelming that we should be thrust profoundly to the next step. That next step is to place our personal trust firmly in God. But here we find an interesting paradox. We have examined our faith. The assurances and evidences are compelling. It should be an easy matter to place our trust in someone who is omnipotent and omniscient. But we are reluctant and we struggle. We struggle because of our pride. We struggle because of our imperfections. The great prophet Nephi understood perfectly. There is no more eloquent statement of that struggle and resulting trust 
than that found expressed by Nephi in the Book of Mormon in the fourth chapter of Second Nephi. I commend it to you for a complete reading. He begins by describing in verses 17 and 18 feelings that we have all had. He says, Nevertheless, notwithstanding the great goodness of the Lord in showing me His great and marvelous works, in other words, Nephi is rehearsing the evidence of things unseen. He continues, My heart exclaimeth, O wretched man that I am, yea, my heart sorroweth because of my flesh, my soul grieveth because of mine iniquities. And when I desire to rejoice, my heart groaneth because of my sins. And then he exclaims, Nevertheless, I know in whom I have trusted. My God has been my support. He hath led me. He hath preserved me. He hath filled me with his love. He hath confounded my enemies. He hath heard my cry. He hath given me knowledge by visions. And so he observes, Awake, my soul. Rejoice, O my heart. Do not anger again. Do not slacken my strength. Rejoice, O my heart, and cry unto the Lord, and say, O Lord, I will praise thee forever. Yea, my soul will rejoice in thee, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And then we read this passage with such beautiful visual imagery. O Lord, wilt thou encircle me around in the robe of thy righteousness? Nephi finishes with these final thoughts. Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh. Yea, I know that God will give liberally to him that asketh. Yea, my God will give me if I ask not amiss. Therefore I will lift up my voice unto thee. I will cry unto thee, my God, the rock of my righteousness. Behold, my voice shall forever ascend up unto thee, my rock and my lever, mine everlasting God. Amen. What an, expire, what an inspiring expression of trust in the Lord. Nephi rehearses his experience with the Lord and reaffirms his trust. We would do well to ponder at length on this extraordinary passage. I call to your attention one particular phrase found in verse 34. Nephi says, I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh. That same thought is found in section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This section constitutes the Lord's preface to the Doctrine and Covenants and commandments given in this dispensation. At a time when every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, the Scripture says, then in one long sentence in which the Lord speaks plainly of his grand design, he continues, Wherefore, I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven. In other words, the Lord did what he's done in all generations past. He called a prophet to speak to the people. He continues in verse 19, that man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh, but that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world, that faith also might increase in the earth. So you see, here's a direct admonition from the Lord that the answer to our problems, the solace that we seek, will not be found in the philosophies of men, but through increasing faith and reaffirming our trust in Him. The words of a favorite hymn are so appropriate. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. With patience bear thy cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change He faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know his voice, who ruled them while he dwelt below. How we wish we could see into the future, to know the outcome of every troublesome decision, to arrive at the destination without having to make the journey. Many of you pay your tithing, read the scriptures, keep yourself morally clean and pray with real intent, and yet you fail tests, and your cars break down, and you don't have enough money to pay the rent, and you strike out with someone you hope you had a chance with. 
These are the normal experiences and challenges of life. Your faith is not misplaced. Remember the words of the song, Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. The journey does have a joyful end. That is the message of the plan of redemption. Christ said, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Faith in the plan of redemption and its outcomes leads to keeping the commandments. Faith and trust provide the foundation for a happy and productive life. There isn't anything more important that you could learn here. You can't begin to imagine all the experiences that you will have in your lifetime, and you will be grateful for a full reservoir of faith and trust to see you through. My dear young brothers and sisters, put away your fears, put away your anxieties, especially put away your sins and your pettiness. Believe in His plan. Trust in God. Put not your trust in the arm of flesh. Lean not on your own understanding, but be believing. Come desiring that the Lord will encircle you about in the robe of His righteousness. Study to increase your faith. Study the atonement. Study the resurrection. Study the plan of redemption. Study the relationship between faith and trust and humility. And with that faith and trust firmly in place, a wonderful thing can happen. You can set aside your self-absorption, quiet your anxieties and fears, and fill your souls with love. The Savior's message is clear. Understanding the doctrine should lead to practical application. Practice serving, practice lifting and building and strengthening others. Provide assurances, rehearse the evidence one to another. What a remarkable transformation takes place when we allow our faith to lead to trust. and Our combined faith and trust rekindle love, love of the Savior, love of our fellow man, love for those near and dear to us, love that provides sweetness, true joy, the giving of oneself to others. And you know the most amazing thing will happen. You'll wake up one day with a career, and another day with a companion, and a third day with a family, and then a mortgage, and lower, <laughs> lower back pain, and a stack of bills from your orthodontist. Please know that we believe in you. We have confidence in you. We trust you, and oh, how we love you, and how we pray for your happiness. I witness to you that God's plan of redemption is a true plan of happiness. I add my assurance to those who have come before that Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He fulfilled His role as the Messiah, the Anointed One who atoned for our sins. The resurrection is a reality. We can live eternally with a loving Heavenly Father. May we increase our faith. May we reaffirm our trust in God and rekindle our love. I pray humbly in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.